of esports and why there is an education pathway and why there is a career pathway but i just want to show you this is one of my ultimate uh, favorite images of all time so this is from a tournament called evo in america and i don't know if you can see but on the on the stage is there's two uh, esports players competing but in the in this room in las vegas there are forty two thousand people watching it it's an incredible event and, inc and very passionate and what i didn't realize at the time when you know Andy and I first met uh, in Rio, we did a, a Smash Brothers event. Within each within these esports, there's a community within a community, right? You are part of something special, and the 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 the, the people that play the fighter games um, are an incredibly passionate group. And just I just love that image, and I, I would encourage everyone, you know, when things get back to normal, to go to a live esports event. It is incredibly passionate and i think the difference in the fans who know so much granular detail but when you go to a different events there's a, an, a huge atmosphere different atmosphere sorry to a league of legends event to a rocket league event to a call of duty event and i'm going to talk about uh one of your one of the greatest british esports players who's scottish a guy called shawnee who uh, uh plays for the london royal ravens and you know, he, he's a hero. And this is one thing that we, when we started British Esports, we wanted to create heroes. And I think if you take um, example of British cycling, you know, they had some fantastic or have had some fantastic heroes and they created this pipeline of interest. And, you know, obviously Sir Chris Hoy and obviously Chris Boardman be before them. And for me, I still work in sport and I'm a massive fan of sport, but I'm also an incredible a uh, fan of esports and the benefits in playing esports, which I'm going to talk about. So, yeah, why why have why did I get involved? So, uh, my son was born in August 2000, so he's uh, turning 21 this year, and I saw firsthand as a parent, yeah, you know, what incredible you know enjoyment and fun my son was playing, competing uh, with his teammates uh, over the years. You know, obviously not not just live, but online. And I was incredibly uh, moved by how uh, lucid and how uh, generally happy he was. He, he had a slightly troubled uh, childhood and it was incredible to see that, you know, just by playing this activity with his friends, this sense of community really changed him and really uh, made him incredibly happy. And, uh, you know, without getting kind of too deep, I was amazed you know wearing my sports hat being you know I'm 50 years old and thinking sports sports sport but then I realized there's this whole world of esports and the benefits from playing and the number one point is incredibly important for everyone to realize you know it's the most fully inclusive activity in in my opinion that you can play as a, as a team yeah you can be any color any shape you know, you can be, you know, you can have restriction on your physicality, you know, of, you know, even if you're missing a limb, there's controllers, so you can be participate as part of a team. And that, for me, what, you know, whenever I go to schools or whenever I'm in front of government, you know, I just say, you need to understand this is the most inclusive activity that you can find. And albeit there's different uh, esports titles and people have their own opinions about what's good and bad and about the different ratings, but this is something we can play together. The key thing is we're not promoting this to do over everything else. It's got to be done in moderation. It has to be part of your balanced life. But we've seen personally, or I've seen personally, you know, just down the road where I work in Slough, we did a, a pilot in an alternative provision school where there were children playing together in a Rocket League team who weren't historically allowed in the same physical room because there was uh, issues with their, you know, with their aggression. But by channeling them together and working together as a team, that all softened and they became friends. And there was one uh, individual who hadn't spoken in class for a year because his self-esteem was down. Then he joined this esports club. He then got in the esports team. He then became recognized within the school that he was a great esports player. So other pupils were going up to him and going, wow, can you teach me? How do I learn from this? And the, the pupil's self-esteem literally went from zero up, 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 up. And during class, he started talking and teachers were like, what, you know, what is going on? How has this child you know, progressed in his own self-belief? And it was about being acknowledged for this great activity. You know, that, that's just one example. And then the other example that was incredibly powerful is there was a girl 
in a wheelchair in a school who had never been able to participate in a team for their school. And she was a great gamer and she managed to join the esports team. And the parents wrote me an incredibly powerful letter to say, this is the first time that my daughter has felt included in the school. This is the first time my daughter has felt that she's part of the school community. And again, she was recognized for being great at an activity. And you know, for me, the number one cause, you know, it's recognized the number one cause you know, of addiction in the UK is a lack of self-esteem. And so for me, from the onset, my approach about esports is this is an incredible activity that more people should understand about and should be playing, again, as part of a balanced life. So the list here that you can probably all see and read, you know, it's just things that we've amassed over the few years about telling people and educating people and informing people about the benefits from playing and about, obviously, if you do things that make you happy, it will have a positive mental uh, impact on you. And about three years ago, we were approached by the Royal Air Force to help them uh, set up and guide them on their esports and gaming association. And they chose esports to help combat loneliness on their, on their different uh, bases uh, or stations. And th- what they were saying is they've got these incredibly passionate people who are doing a great job for our country, but they were very isolated. The communal areas had, had been disappeared, but they did a study. And on, and on one of their stations, they had uh, over 600 people playing on their Xboxes, but they were playing in their bedrooms. They weren't playing as a community. So they created these uh, esports hubs. And it was, again, fantastic seeing And they've progressed. And when Insomnia was being played, they had a, a team. And in December, we arranged a Call of Duty tournament with the RAF, the Army, and the Navy playing against the American Air Force um, and you know, their equivalent. Unfortunately, the RAF lost in the final to the US Space Corps. Uh, there's definitely a, a kind of a steward's inquiry about that. But, it, I mean, it was a great progression. And then what's happened is the Army on both sides of the Atlantic, have said, actually, there's some huge benefits and transferable skills in being a good gamer, just on the processing. I'm going to talk about that as well. So during this journey of me, you know, really focusing on the benefits of esports and what a great way of acknowledging and and helping kids. And, you know, we've been doing a number of pilots. So uh, in 2017, we did a a tournament, uh, sorry, a week where we did uh, Rocket League, FIFA, and football skills at West Ham Foundation. And we were very kindly supported by uh, London Sport that was part of England Sport, Sport England at the time. And we were just trying to see how we could transfer skills between the two. And if people were a bit embarrassed about playing football, could they learn skills from uh, Rocket League? And what was really uh, powerful is we had a number of people in the UK who were involved in sport coming down to check us out. Because in 2017, there's still a bit of, you know, curious, what is this esports? Is it a sport? Will it have an impact on sport? And what happened is at that time, uh, the head of esports for the Olympics, the IOC, uh, the International Olympic Committee, came over to check out what we were doing. And then after that, uh, about a year later, they set up the esports uh, gaming and liaison group, which British esports are part of. And we've helped shape and helped them understand about the incredible power of the esports. And obviously, then since happened is uh, video games and sports have gone into virtual sports. So you've got esports and you've got virtual sports. We're very focused uh, on esports. We then met with people like Oxford Internet University. We met with great people like uh, Professor Andy here. Um, and just understanding about, you know, was there some quantitative and qualitative um, answers that we could give people? You know, you know, personally, I've got a massive issue about social media, you know, and, you know, watching passive media, whereas... Some people would describe esports as an active media, you know, how you're interacting and, and you're sharing. And as, as I say, I've seen firsthand as a parent the benefits of this. And then about a year ago, we were impro- approached by Imperial Health. Um, they were doing a study in dementia prevention. And what they uh, came to us to say was globally, children that leave, that leave full-time education around 12, so that could be in India or could be in South America, are twice as likely to get dementia. And that really kind of was like an amazing statistic. And I was saying, well, why is that? And they said, well, you know, if uh, you don't build up your memory function, your hippocampus or hippocampi with a certain amount of uh, functionality, then when you're age of 16, we all lose 1% of our memory function. So a bit like a bodybuilder, if you build up your strength and you lose 1%, it doesn't matter. But what they came to us is they said, look, we think esports in particular, because of the human-human interaction and because you're always playing games of skill, could be 
uh, a f- great focus group. It, you know, in the old days, we used to play uh, bridge and chess. Obviously, they're both fantastic games, but actually, this is a modern version. And how can we prove that actually playing uh, certain esports for a certain amount of time is going to help uh, your memory function? And you know, this is uh, something that we started, and we're very excited to be part of that. And I know, I think Abite are on the call later, or sorry, on this uh, conference later, and Dundee. So during this time, we were approached by uh, Pearson, who are uh, a great uh, education company, about you know how can we start doing some education pathways. And this, and I know there's a session later. This is not about trying to make everyone becoming a pro esports player. This is about the whole ecosystem around esports, about the production, about the marketing, about just a bit like a sports team, about that. So we started last September with uh, BTEC. I know we're talking uh, to the. Uh, everyone in Scotland about trying to create something up here with SQA. Um, and we're just trying to promote the values of esports and use it as a way of engaging with children uh, to kind of learn other skills, which are, are transferable skills. So I'm just uh, going to connect to my, I've been rabbiting on, so I, I need to click to the next slide. There you go. So yeah, this was a great photo. So on my left is my chair, who you're gonna, who's going to be closing the conference today, Andy um, uh, Payne. OBE, who got an OBE for the video games. And this was at Insomnia two years ago uh, when we could do live events. And this was a winning team. Uh, and we participate in Rocket League, Overwatch, and uh, League of Legends. And this was the winning team in a live stage. And it was a fantastic uh, for us to see live. As I say, it's very important for you to uh, see things live. Just going to go to the next slide. Yeah, sorry. So skills, let's talk about skills. It's very important. Yeah, 50% of children do not go to university. You know, the Secretary of State for Education, Gavin Williamson, you know, he's very pro-vocational skills. Yeah, so am I, and so are we. So those that don't go to university, you know, what skills can they learn, you know, at secondary school? And we believe, again, you know, studying esports or the skills around esports is incredibly important. So when you're actually playing esports or arranging esports, yeah, these are a list of a number of skills that you can generally gain by playing. And I know in the old days, you know, if you had a great golf handicap, you know, that was important in your CV. If you're a certain level League of Legends player or a Dota player, you know, I know there's companies in America that actually ask you, are you a, you know, are you a gamer? What is your standard? Because it shows that you know, what type of brain you have and what, if you're into strategy. Um, and I know, as I said earlier, in the armed forces, they look for people who've got great dexterity. And even surgeons, you know, there's a great example of, you know, keyhole surgeons who have come, who are the better ones have come from being gamers, you know, with that dexterity. But not only that, these are life skills. You know, these are important for you to understand around playing video games, but, you know, not obviously we're promoting esports titles as well. So what happened over the last five years is we realized about, you know, this is a great activity but how can we actually professionalize it? How can we create you know, tra- these transferable skills, improve your soft skills, but also create uh, this education pathway? And you know, to have future jobs, you need future qualifications. And again, I know that we're going to talk about that later. This was us um, at the World Skills event in Birmingham about two years ago. And we had one of the most popular stands. And this was, uh, we had a Rocket League tournament. We had shoutcasters there. We had people really engaging with it, with an activity. And depending on how you look at esports, and obviously we've got a very wide uh, aspect of what's going on, it's a fun event to do. You're competing and you're socializing. And I think what's happened during lockdown, or the lockdowns, the gamers have actually survived a lot better than pure sports people because the sports people have been missing out on socialization and that competitive edge. And what we've seen and what we've helped, you know, a number of different uh, national governing bodies in the UK, you know, basketball being one, we've been helping them putting on tournaments and the AOC uh, colleges as well, putting on FIFA tournaments. And I think it's important that we are not a threat to sports. We are a complement to sports. And I think it's very important that people understand that. And I know uh, there's a, an incredible statistic in America that EA uh, confirmed at an IOC meeting about a year ago that they did some research of under 18 girls that play football in America and 20% of people, 20% of the girls said they got into playing football because they played the game FIFA. So that's a great thing. We should all be promoting on on our different um, industries that we're in, 
the values of uh, physical health and mental health and making people happy. So it was really great to see, you know, Esports should help people be more active and vice versa. And what I'm very um, pleased about and honored about is that, you know, we are recognized as British esports as promoting those values. But more importantly, you know, some of our heroes in the UK, like Wolfies is a Fortnite player. You know, he promotes good mental health. He promotes good physical health. He's an A, a scholar student. But this is important that we, we must advocate, a, you know, a good code of conduct, treat people fairly and, you know, nicely but also promote the values of a kind of more inclusive uh, approach to life. So one thing I wanted to highlight also, you know, people, you know, when you go to these live events, unlike kind of uh, football or sport, and as I say, I am involved in sport, you know, the actual production values of live esports is incredible. And what you've got to understand is un instead of just following one football or following a, a rugby ball around or a tennis ball, when you're producing esports events, you're following 10 individuals who are on a, a map and the skill set of the production team to be able to forecast or highlight or show in real time, oh, you know, Andy's about to do an amazing shot or blah, blah, blah. It's incredibly skillful. And this, you know, there's some great universities and I know up in Scotland, obviously, Abate is renowned and Dundee for video games, but you've got uh, a great um, university called Conf uh, Confetti College, which is part of Nottingham, who are teaching you know, now esports uh, degree courses in production and the values that you're teaching. So I, I do kind of um, not laugh because that's the wrong word. I do smile when people sort of are derogatory about esports and what's going on. The technical skills that you are learning in production in particular for live events and for online events is immense. And I, I worked at Wembley uh, Stadium for 10 years and there's normally around twice as many people putting on a e live esports event than there would be for a concert. And I think you've got to understand, you know, how important and how intricate this is and the skills that you've got to have. And I'm very proud to be part of this industry. So the other one that, you know, going back to kind of more granular stuff is around soft skills. And this is something when I go to schools and I speak to teachers about, you know, about, you know, it's important for people to be able to communicate, especially what's been going on you know, with COVID, COVID and isolation and how to interact and solve problems. And this is, again, important from an employability point of view, that you learn as a team. You know, people don't like being told you know, that they've done something wrong, but there's something about playing as a team where people are learning together. And these soft skills are incredibly important, in, not only in life, but also from an employment point of view. And I, what I do like about esports is the thing that you're trying to beat another human or another group of humans. And I think it's you know, that that tenacity that you have to have, that skill that you have, uh, you have to have is really transferable. And as I say, you know, I've, it's been a huge honor for me, you know, for the last five years to progress, you know, where we've got, and it wouldn't have been possible without, you know, great people on our board and great people um, on my, you know, on the, on the staff as well. So I just wanted to finish with uh, a few examples uh, of what's been happening and what is going to be happening. So first of all, the Olympics. You know, last year when Tokyo was going to be happening, Intel as a sponsor was going to do. We we're going to do a two-day uh, esports, sorry, two-title esports tournament before. And as Andy said, you know, I, I tried something in Rio 2016. I think the world just wasn't ready and. Uh, yeah, they didn't quite understand it. But now, you know, uh, in 2019, the Global Esports Federation was founded, which British Esports is a, is a member of. And they're also a not-for-profit organization like us. And they're promoting the values of esports, but they're also going in to help promoting virtual sports as well and, and AR and stuff, which I know Andy's uh, maybe talking about later. I'm not sure. Um, but, yeah, I just wanted to let you know that there are these organizations that are not-for-profit, that people, you know, there's over 200 volunteers trying to help people understand, you know, the benefits of esports, trying to help uh, with infrastructure, trying to help just understand and give people people and the youth an opportunity to develop their skills. With regard to kind of Birmingham 20, 2022 with the Commonwealth Games uh, wearing our Global Esports Federation hat, we've been trying to help and try and create a, um, a tournament there maybe before the Games. Um, so that's still, you know, hopefully in the pipeline, uh, which we we'll be, should be announcing soon. I don't think it's a secret that there have been conversations. Um, but then you go over to Hangzhou in China in September 22, Esports is a part of the official uh, Asia Games. That's just the Para Games there, but it is part of the Asian Games as well, the main games. It will be a medal event. 
Um, and that's pretty incredible that, you know, in Asia, they do view uh, esports as a sport, whereas under UK law, uh, we're a game like chess and bridge. And to be honest, we're very happy about our classification uh, because when we've gone into schools and we've met teachers, we're not trying to say, don't do football, do esports. What we're trying to say is there's skills, um, so there's benefits from both. I talked earlier about uh, the Royal Air Force Esports uh, and Gaming uh, Group, which is a fantastic uh, initiative. And, I, and we're, I'm, again, we're really proud to have been part of that journey. Uh, and they've gone on leaps and bounds and they've got you know, people who are just playing for fun in social gaming, but they've also got their esports teams. And then finally, uh, before I kind of hand back to Andy, I just want to talk about uh, Shawnee. So he, he's obviously one of your, I don't know if people, how many people know about Shawnee, but he uh, plays for the London Royal Ravens, which is the UK's Call of Duty uh, franchise league, which plays in the CDL. There's 12 teams, nine in America, one in Canada, one in France, and then the UK team is the London Royal Ravens. It's really important for us to help develop and nurture talent. And it's something that our role, you know, we are a national, we're the national body, but really an amateur body, like an old sports body where we focus on grassroots. And our journey is to nurture talent as well as trying to get everyone to enjoy it as an activity. But we need more heroes. And it's very important, you know, that we acknowledge that and recognize that, you know, and, you know, in the UK, we've had Wolfies, which was three years ago, he came second in an esports tournament, uh, Fortnite World Cup. And he won $1.1 million. And everyone's going on about, oh, it's great, he's a millionaire. But actually, you know, what he achieved was incredible. You know, 40 million people entered that tournament and him and his partner came second. You know, it's really incredible. Just the skill that these uh, people have got playing. But I think it's very important for us to acknowledge and recognize and celebrate, you know, this talent and not be embarrassed, you know, that these guys are playing video games, but actually they're, they're, promoting their uh, mental skills as they're doing that. So Andy, I just kind of gave an overview kind of uh, you know, where I've gone to uh, in life, but I, you know, I'm, you know, I kind of call it my philanthropic, philanthropic <laughs> aspect of esports. And it's been, a, it's been a, a huge privilege, again, working with great people, but also just making people happy, you know, especially during the last year and a half. So. Yeah, massively. And that's such a fantastic overview, Chester, because it covers so much ground and is a great way to kick off. Because I think we often sort of imagine this is a community that's quite fully formed and established, but actually new people are joining all the time. And I'm really hopeful that many people in this event today are just finding their first steps in the world of esports and trying to understand what's going on. And they may have heard a bit about it, but don't really fully understand how to get involved. So if you are a college or a university and you're kind of interested and want to think about building something, where would you sort of advise people to sort of begin? Yeah, so, I mean, we've obviously got a team of schools and colleges, liaison officers, you know, come to us. But also what we can help do is introduce other teachers who have gone through that journey as well. And, and I think, you know, we've been doing this, say, for five years. We've got some great advocates. There's some incredible colleges that have already got, you know, 70, 80 children studying uh, BTEC and esports, but also, as I say, we're going to try and do that up in Scotland as well. So I think come to us. We've got a team of 10 staff really happy to help in any way and introduce you. So not just hear it from us. Yeah, we're, we're, there's no gain for us in promoting a single title like that. We're here to promote the values of esports. And as I say, you know, we're a not for profit and we're doing it for good reasons. The one thing I would say is a parent or an adult, if you, if you have no idea about this world, just engage with someone who is under 20. Uh, to speak to them about their gaming and what do they do. And, and just the key thing is understanding the difference between esports and gaming. You know, esports is always human versus human. It's always games of skill. And I think that's, you've got to understand that as an adult or as a college. This isn't people trying to compete against self. This is, this is teamwork. And this is, there's a huge amount of kind of skills around that, as I've just talked about for the last 20 minutes. We have got a question actually in the chat already from Brian from the British from the Scottish Esports Hub, who's mentioned that he feels that there's, it is quite a challenging career to pursue as an esports professional. And, and I wonder what sort of advice do you have, or what support do we have for players that are trying to find their way in this world, but also I guess protect themselves for kind of long term career aspirations too. Yeah, I mean, again, it's t it's tough to be a professional uh, sportsman. Um, so I think you know, depending on, you know, without not knowing enough, you know, depending on the, the title that you're choosing and your level, um, you know, it is tough. But I think what we're trying to do is create this ecosystem. At the moment, you've got 
at the top and an elite system of you know the CDL, the OWL, the League of Legends Worlds, and then you've got amateur. And what's what you're going to see? And Andy said we are at the beginning. You know, we're going to see some more medium tier, some European qualifications. You have more opportunities for you to compete. And I think once more money comes in to to kind of create that uh, ecosystem, the middle tier ecosystem, then it's going to be easier for people to progress a bit like in football, where you become you know, a better player or you can be financed to be a better player. So it will come. We just need more people to engage, more brands to engage with it. Yeah. And like you said, so much has happened over the sort of lockdown period. I think esports have done really well to keep people together to sort of, I guess, guard against some of these challenges around loneliness that we've all sort of faced over this period. So there's quite a, a nice sort of story as to what's happened over the last 12 months in esports, isn't there? Yeah, uh, yeah, we've been very fortunate. I mean, we, again, we've been we've helped a lot of people, and, and uh, you know how resilient we've been of going online straight away. You know, even our live our British esports championships, we've switched to that. But we're hoping to do our final live uh, in the summer. So yeah, we're switching back. <laughs> There's nothing uh, better than seeing people, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I would say that certainly having a look at the British Esports Association website, there are so many resources for people who are wanting to enter the profession in a whole variety of ways, whether it's as a player or someone involved in production, or even if you're just trying to set up a a community within your college, it's a great place to start to find out a range of those different career options that are available to students that are studying this or pursuing that sort of career. So thanks so much, Chester, for kicking us off on the right foot. And I think really just setting us off for a a fantastic day of discussions about all these different skills and the evidence as to what we have already taking place in Scotland. So thanks very much. Great. Thank you very much, Andy. And everyone have a great day.